This is the You Can Learn Chinese podcast. For everyone who's trying to learn Chinese or reaching for the next level, you came to the right place. I am your host, Jared Turner, longtime resident of China, co-founder of the Mandarin Companion Graded Reader Series, and here's a joke for all you psychics out there. My co-host is John Paston, co-founder of Mandarin Companion, founder of All Set Learning, the Chinese grammar wiki Sinosplice.com, and celebrates Columbus Day by breaking into his neighbor's house and discovering their furniture. This is the second episode of a four-part series about learning how to read Chinese. In this episode, John and I discuss how to get into reading at an early stage, even if you don't have anything that is low enough for you to read. Guest interviews with Heather Turner, mother of five, professional baker, and most recently, a fifth grade Chinese teacher. All this and more, let's get to it. Hey guys, this is Jared Turner coming at you from Utah in the United States. And I am John Pazden, located in Shanghai, China. All right, guys, we have got quite the show for you. This is part two of About Learning to Read in Chinese. Before we get into the episode, we've got a few reviews. We got a five out of five stars from Stars Jez 101. Informative and interesting show. I love this show. (laughs) <laughs> listening to Jared and John discussing all things related to the never-ending journey of learning Chinese, particularly like the interviews with different people who give a wide range of perspectives on Chinese learning. Keep up the good work, guys, and thanks for sharing your knowledge and experiences. Well, thank you for leaving our review, and we will indeed keep it up. Thanks a lot. Our next review is from ePlate. That's like ePlate. A five-star review says, thank you so much, j and J. Hey, maybe we should call ourselves that. No, not really. I absolutely love this show. Every time I start to feel hopeless, I just listen to one of these. It really gives me back my motivation and reminds me why I'm learning Chinese. They remind me that it is difficult, which is part of why I love it. I would have quit months ago if I didn't have this podcast. I have not only gotten my motivation back, but I have tried different learning techniques, which have really made a difference. Thank you. Wow, that is great. E-plate, so happy to hear that. And John, that makes me feel like what we're doing is really worth it. Yeah, and I got to say, that's one of my pet peeves when people can't stop saying how easy Chinese is. It's like, dude, this is hard. Either you're trying to call me stupid (laughs) or you're wrong. (laughs) Yeah. Okay, so this one comes from an email and it's from Cohen. He or she says, gentlemen, ran into your podcast, like it a lot, especially all the stories of people who have actually managed to learn the language. Not quite there yet myself, but working on it. HSK5, I know you're no fans, but just have a target. Your advice to read a lot at my level to hone in on the vocab and language patterns was very helpful. I use a whole pile of secondhand textbooks I found, including some very old ones. Learning a lot along the way about the image of China the Beijing Language Institute has wanted to project over the years. And about student dorms, soybean milk, and basketball. (laughs) Cheers and keep up the good work. Thanks a lot. And then our last review... It's from Caleb, and it's Wen Jia Le. Amazing podcast, five stars. I started the podcast a couple weeks ago and just finished. They were absolutely amazing. I'm looking forward to all the future podcasts. I started learning Mandarin roughly two and a half years ago and spent over 2,000 hours of personal study so far. I finished all the main apps, Chinese Skilled, Duolingo, Hello Chinese, etc., and finished Yo-Yo Chinese, Pimsleur, etc., but I wish this podcast was out a couple years ago because it would have helped me progress much faster in my Chinese learning journey instead of, for an example, of wasting close to 400 hours fully completing Duolingo to get the whole tree turned to gold. I don't have the opportunity to move to China, so I really appreciate all the resources you guys have made so that I can continue to learn Chinese at more intermediate level at home. I've really enjoyed reading the greater readers and also hearing all the different interviews and how these individuals have actually learned Chinese. I just want to say thanks again to Jared and John for all your hard work. Well, Caleb, thanks, man. And we're so glad that this has been helpful to you. Yeah, and I don't even want to know how many hours I've wasted on bad study methods because (laughs) (laughs) it's a little depressing. I'll just move forward, I think. Okay, so today we're going to talk about part two of how to learn to read Chinese. And we're talking about baby steps to real reading. So last time we talked about pinyin and characters and learning early vocabulary. But today what we're talking about is this really big problem where you know some characters, you know some words, but you feel like you just can't read. You know, you you can't read a book. You're at this block, you know, the wall of characters still feels insurmountable, even though you know some characters. I think we've all been there, right? Yeah, totally. So the question is, 
what are these baby steps that you take? How do you go from, you know, knowing some characters, knowing some words to actually reading? Today, I want to split this into kind of two parts. One is getting more familiar with the characters. And then two is how to start to read. Because uh, an issue that a lot of people have is they're not really that familiar with the characters and they can do flashcards and they assume that's enough. But when you put a bunch of them together, it's overwhelming. It's that concept of cognitive load, right? And so it's one thing to know those characters in isolation. But man, when you're putting it together and you're actually trying to make sense of it, yeah, it's hard. Right. So the kinds of mistakes I'm talking about are even before that. I see people where they've learned, you know, ni, wa, ta. But then when they try to read a sentence, they read ni as ta or they blank on hun, you know, the word for very. I don't know. It's almost like they haven't learned anything, even though they really have studied those characters a lot. The thing that is not going to help you get over this hump, get past this barrier, is to just drill individual character flashcards. So yeah, you need to learn the characters. Yeah, you need to know, you know, the component parts, the structure, but you can't just drill those forever. That does not help you read. So one thing that might help a little bit more is to drill yourself on uh, words or phrases. Like if you really insist on doing flashcards, then reviewing words with more than one character or maybe some phrases, that will move you closer. But what you really got to do is practice reading sentences. But you got to start with super simple sentences that have characters that you've already learned and words that you already know. You know, I think this is a very good point. And John, you know, I had never even thought about this until I had talked to some learner who had said, hey, look, you know, I put phrases, I put legit full sentences on flashcards. And that is an optimal way to progress forward than to be just be stuck in on single character flashcards. Right. And uh, you, you don't have to do it with flashcards, though. Like I personally uh, am not big on flashcards. I have used them. But let me offer an, an alternative approach that doesn't use flashcards. So let's suppose you've learned, you know, between 50 and 100 characters. You want to get to reading, but you just you're not there yet. One thing you can do is something that I learned from a blogger named Katsumoto, who wrote all Japanese all the time. The concept is called sentence mining. And he often uses sentence mining in the sense of like learning how to use a new word by getting useful sentences, which use that word in different ways. That's cool. But what we're talking about here is just finding sentences that are so simple that they only use the words and the characters you know. And that's a challenge in itself. But like some ways you could do that would be you're using a textbook. So you go through all the dialogues you've studied, all the sample sentences, you know, you go in the Chinese grammar wiki and look at the really simple sentences and you just find sentences that you can totally read all the characters and words for and you copy and paste them or, or you can write them by hand if you really want to. And you just start collecting these sentences and then you can read them for practice. You can mix up the order. You can change the size and the font of the Chinese because looking at the same sentences in different orders, different fonts, that's the kind of practice you need to familiarize yourself with Chinese as sentences. Yeah. And so essentially what we're doing in this instance, we're adding a variety of context. You know, you throw a character or a word into Google Translate and, you know, it spits something out. Do we know that's the right definition for that context that we want to use it in? Maybe not necessarily. So it's just underscoring the importance of context. And, you know, John, I love you when you're sharing this method because that's what we're doing. We're adding more context, giving more meaning to the characters that we have instead of something that's just siloed and isolated to a single flashcard. Yeah, and that's kind of the key here is more context. So if you're doing sentence mining, it's only one sentence worth of context, which is way more than you get when you do an individual word, but obviously it's a lot less than an entire story's context. But the sentence level of context I find is super useful, especially when wanting to move towards being able to read. So one of the things you can do, especially if you have a teacher or a Chinese friend helping you, is find sentences that are almost readable, but maybe they have one hard word, like maybe it's a person's name, and just swap it for a ta, or you know maybe there's this noun that you really don't need to learn, swap it for another noun. And you get help from this other person because they confirm that, yeah, that's a good sentence. Yeah, that's right. Or maybe there's this long sentence and you just want part of it. Is that a good sentence if I just take out this part? Yes, it is. 
All right, so then do that. So it's not only copying and pasting, it's also sometimes modifying with a little bit of outside input, but just getting these sentences that you can handle that reinforce the characters and words that you already know that you can then read and read again. That's a fantastic approach. And so if you're stuck to flashcards or something, or that's what you're doing, you know, this is a great way just to simply expand what you're doing. So, you know, write this down, go out and do it right away. Okay, and I said before that we're doing two things. One is getting more familiar with the characters, and two is starting to read. And I'm realizing now that I kind of just mix those together. <laughs> but another thing, you know, suppose you're collecting these sentences. Sometimes they're modified. Sometimes they aren't. But another thing that you can do um, once you're a little bit farther along, like kind of an elementary A2 level, is you make your own sentences. So, for example, one thing that all beginners do is they work on a self-introduction, and maybe you have your two sentence introduction about your name and where you're from and but make that a little longer and then perfect it put the information that you really want to include learn all the vocabulary and then you know writing that and then rereading it possibly rewriting it is also really good reading practice because in chinese when you're typing writing is reading practice yeah all right and just in case you haven't started typing chinese let me clarify a little bit in chinese most people nowadays use pinyin input for writing Chinese. So they know the pinyin for the words they know, they type that out, and then some possible characters will pop up, and they need to choose the correct ones for what they want to say. So a lot of times, you know, we know the pinyin, we easily forget the characters. So by typing out sentences and repeatedly having to choose the correct characters and choose the ones that are in a list with a bunch of other ones, you know, you're exercising your ability to recognize the correct characters. And a lot of times it's really obvious like, yeah, clearly it's this word, but still, it's good practice. And so just typing the sentences that you want to say and then having to choose those characters for the input method is a good form of practice in itself. You know, I've mentioned this a number of times, John. That's how I learned a number of characters. Basic characters were simply typing them out. I'm like, I think this is right. <laughs> and it turns out it was. And so you see them again and again, it helps. And to, you know, build on this, John, about, you know, hey, creating your own stuff, there's a number of ways to do this. One that I do like, there's actually a name for it. It's called the language experience approach. Pretty much what you do is you get a friend or someone else, a teacher even, who knows Chinese well and can write or type. And so what you do is you just start speaking about something you know about. Okay, so you could describe a scene or you could tell about your day or you could pretend you're telling something, any, anything. You talk about anything in Chinese and that person will write it down. So what's happening is that you're putting some Chinese and obviously you know what you're saying, hopefully, and uh, that person is writing it down. So now they're creating something that's going to be at your level. Maybe the person will be able to edit it a little bit and maybe make a little offer, some corrections. And, and so now you're going to have something that you can go and read. It's a really intuitive, and you think about it, like, oh, if, why didn't I think about that? Well, it's a really nice, uh, easy way to start creating a little bit of material at your own level. Yeah, and there's also the, the loner version of the same activity, which is you use some kind of a voice-to-text program that dictates what you're saying in Chinese. But those can be hilariously bad. But just talking and seeing how it transcribes your speech into Chinese and seeing if it's correct can be an interesting form of practice in itself. But that is kind of getting into speaking practice and it's less, you know, reading, right? There's another thing that you can do. This is you do need some existing content and you could do this something maybe you've created already, but also it could be something from a textbook. But get another person who's also learning Chinese, ideally about your level. Take a sentence maybe from the textbook or something that you have, or maybe a short article. And what you do is you take turns reading a sentence. So the person reads as they read out in Chinese you try to translate the meaning into your language and act out its meaning. And then you switch roles. You know, you would read in Chinese and they would try to translate it back. This is called sometimes volleyball reading or ping pong reading, but it's something where it's a little bit cooperative and allows you to, you know, maybe dig into some sentences and keep things moving along. It actually can be a lot of fun. Cool. One thing I do want to uh, point out, though, kind of a little bit of a warning. If you're using writing, you know, typing as a way to practice character recognition, and then you start doing chat, like chat is going to very quickly at this level devolve into like looking up words over and over. There's nothing wrong with that. It's good to communicate with people. That's the whole reason you're learning the language probably. You want to communicate, right? Just keep in mind that when you're chatting and getting lots of new vocabulary, lots of new characters, 
you're not really reinforcing all those words and characters you know. You're focused more on what you don't know. So um, focusing on what you know, collecting those sentences, reading back through them, shuffling them, changing the font, changing the size of the text so that it feels a little different, that practice is what's going to be especially useful to moving you towards being able to read like a very basic story. Well, John, let's even take that example because we do have a lot of cases of that where people are using chat programs. We chat a lot for Chinese. And how can we take that experience and turn it into something that is a better effective learning approach? What I'm going to suggest, John, in this, and I'd love to hear what your thoughts are, but we go back to that original flashcard version, right? So maybe you're exposing things that you don't know and you're looking up a lot of words, but now you're creating some sentences and maybe you're using this new word. Well, you can go back to that chat history because it's written down. Let's copy that. Let's put those on flashcards. And if we do something like that, we're trying to cycle it into our vocabulary and we're getting enough reinforcement, it can now turn into a learning experience if we focus as well on some deliberate learning, not just you know passively hoping that we're going to pick it up. Yeah, that can be great. And that can uh, really feed into that whole sentence mining thing I was talking about. Almost always when you talk to native speakers who aren't teachers, they're going to drop some pretty random and not very useful vocabulary that kind of stumps you. So that's the kind of thing you'd probably want to edit out of uh, what you're copying out of the chat history. But yeah, that's totally great. They might ask you a really good question that you've never been asked before, and it's actually composed of words you totally know. Stuff like that is gold. Like you want to grab it and save it and then practice reading it. I got to say, John, that that's also how I learned some slang, you know, and just kind of understanding well, how people might just say things casually, you know, just from, from chats. And that was helpful. Yeah. And sometimes some of that slang is like totally basic characters. Uh, it's not in your textbooks, but uh, people say it and it's not even hard. And it makes you look cool. So cool. You know, we have an article that's on our website. It was a guest author from Diane Neubauer, who we've had on the show before. She's a Chinese teacher. She's fantastic. We love you, Diane. The article is saying, what if beginning level Chinese books are too hard? And so it's 10 tips on, you know, for beginner readers. You know, one of the things that she brings up in this is like about listening to slow audio while you read along. We're now kind of bridging the gap. Let's say, all right, you, you've been moving along, you've been studying, you've been leveling up, but you're still not quite there. And, you know, maybe you're close to our breakthrough, right? Our breakthrough level is 150 characters. Well, one of the things is to get slow audio. And the great thing about a lot of the audio books these days is that you can actually adjust the speed. So even if the narrator is reading a little bit fast, you can drop that speed, I think, to like 25%, you know? And uh, 25%. I, I, okay, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not just saying you can. I didn't say do it, all right? But, you know, <laughs> if it comes to that point where, you know, you're trying to put the sentences together, you need to slow it down a little bit so you can start to fall in those characters, that can be a great way. And this is also helpful if you don't have the audio or whatever. If you have a, someone who has the level of Chinese where they can read it fluently, where they're reading slowly along with you. And so, as Terry Waltz says, you're matching a squiggle with a sound. Or they can record it at a normal speed and then you can just slow it. Totally. And then, you know, I just mentioned Terry Waltz. We've had her on the podcast. She's amazing. But she has also some very low-level graded readers. Some of her uh, simple books have like only 40 characters that are used in them, but they're of length. So it's tons of repetition. And so her language isn't always as selective in it, but it's still great. So there are some very low-level stuff out there. And just get out there and do it. And I think the last thing, John, about this is that we've given you guys a whole bunch of ideas on ways that you can essentially create some sort of things that you can read that will be at your level and possibly just a little step higher. So once you've got this stuff, reread it, reread it again, go over it again. You can continue to do all these things and create new materials that are just suitable and suited for you. It takes a little work. And you need some help from a Chinese speaker, but you can do it. And so if you got a tutor and they want to focus on like, hey, you know, a curriculum or something, well, hey, you know, you're paying that tutor or that teacher. Say, hey, I want to do this and start creating your own stuff. And you can just keep churning this out. And you can also have an endless supply of things at your own level. Yeah, and I think one thing that people don't do enough during their Chinese lessons is get the teacher to record stuff. So whether you're sitting with a teacher in person or whether it's an online lesson, you know, you're paying for the teacher's time, just ask them to read it out loud and record it and then send you the MP3 audio. Like you could do that every lesson for some little piece of text. It only takes a minute or two of the lesson and then you can just keep going over it and over it. So you have the audio, you have the text, 
And like all of this stuff really is about trade-offs. How much time do you have? And how much money do you have that you want to spend? If you have a ton of time, then you can do all kinds of sentence mining and hunting through old textbooks and finding just the individual sentences that are really good and useful, even though most of them are boring and horrible. If you have a little <laughs> more money, then you can you know, spend more on teachers, on books, maybe a little bit less sentence mining. But um, all this is doable no matter which category you fall into. Totally. You know, and John, I even got an email from one of our listeners, Jessica Mann. She records her lessons with her tutor on video. She does it on like on Zoom and she goes back and redoes it. Like you guys, there's just so many things you can do like this. Part of this is that we're also saying, guys, is that you can take control of your learning experience. You don't need just to be always sit back passively saying, hey, what's out there? You can do it. And I've been also working with a YouTuber and we're talking who's a polyglot with people learning a lot of languages. And this is a big problem for a lot of languages where they're just not these materials. But you guys, you just take control of it. You can get out there. You can do this. You can learn Chinese. You can learn Chinese. All right. So that's the end of part two. And we'll go into part three next time. Okay. Now it's time for a word from our sponsor. And today our sponsor is... Mandarin Companion. Today we're going to talk about a level one book. It is probably our most difficult level one book. So if you're one of those people that are more interested in level two than level one, then this is the single level one book that might be of most interest to you. That's right. And it is The Prince and the Popper. When we got reviews back from our test readers when we first wrote this, they all said this was their favorite story. Yeah, this one was really fun to adapt because we made quite a few changes. We had to do like medieval China, but we didn't want to be all historically accurate. So it's kind of like fictional historical China. So it was fun. Anyway, it's a great story. Originally, Mark Twain wrote this book, and it's a fantastic graded reader. So go out there and get it today. The Prince and the Pauper, you can find it on Kindle, iBooks, Kobo, or wherever you get your books. Thanks, guys. Okay, now it's time for Rants and Raves. John, what do you got for us today? You got a rant or do you have a rave? I have a rave. It's kind of a weird rave. It's about glamping in China. <laughs> Oh. I just had this glamping experience over the October holiday. In case you don't know, my mom didn't know this word. It's a glamour camping. You're not really roughing it, but you're kind of camping. Because of the whole COVID situation, anyone with kids in school in Shanghai were not allowed to leave the province of Shanghai during the eight-day holiday. So we went to Chongming Island, which is an island off the coast, which is technically part of the Shanghai municipality, and they have camping there. And we did two different kinds. We did these giant bubble houses and we did these uh, these tents on a campsite. I really had to like change my way of thinking because like, you know, like look at you, Jared, you're in Utah and you guys do real camping out there. I know. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And this is not that. <laughs> you know, they set up like outdoor cooking that you can buy raw meat for and barbecue. Like everything is done for you. And there's like all these people in this tiny space. It's prepackaged. All right. So what do you got, Jared? I've got a rave today, and my rave is for Robin McPherson. So Robin, he has a YouTube channel that's called The Life of Rob. This guy is awesome. Robin, he produces like three videos a week, and he does everything by himself. He's a polyglot. He speaks French, Japanese, uh, I think German. He has a pretty decent proficiency level of Chinese already. Doesn't he speak Spanish too? I don't remember. I actually, actually, should dude, when you up. talk about a polyglot, you got to get right how many languages they know. They're going to be like, I speak ten languages. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but he's a he's a great guy. He's super enthusiastic, and he uh, has just a lot of great advice and insights for learning languages, any languages. And recently, I did a five part interview with him, talking about extensive reading and how it applies not just to Chinese but just to all languages. And this podcast episode specifically, I think, relates to that because there are so many languages out there, like someone's learning Eastern Serbian or something, and people are learning just maybe obscure languages or stuff that's just not popular at all. And there's just not like learning materials out there. And so it's been interesting in a lot of his followers and people in the comments just making a lot of questions. And we speak directly to a lot of these issues of learners trying to learn their target language and how to apply extensive reading to their language learning efforts and when they have materials and when they don't have materials. Anyway, you can go check it out there. We'll have it in the show notes. It's a Robin McPherson 
the Life of Rob is his YouTube channel. Okay, so free videos on YouTube, right? Yeah, of course it's free, John. It's YouTube. <laughs> Don't tell me you actually paid for like YouTube prime or whatever that is well youtube is trying to get me to pay for something every time i access the site but no i don't pay for youtube does anyone actually pay for that i mean like seriously no, so i know some people do but in china no no i'm not paying for it stop <laughs> trying to get me to pay for it john okay so uh, i think we've turned into a rant now how about we uh, continue with an interview my name is heather turner if her name sounds familiar to any of you that might be because you've heard me talk about her before on this podcast. She's my wife. I am a mom of five kids. I lived in China for nearly seven years in Shanghai. Heather and I carved out our own path in China, but sitting down to talk with her underscored to me how different everyone's language learning experience is despite our common circumstances. I have been a dental hygienist, baker, and I am currently a Chinese long-term substitute teacher. Stay with us. Well, Heather, I obviously know a lot about you, but why did you start learning Chinese? And we had this crazy idea, you and I, to move to Shanghai with... Wait, you and me? Yes. Okay, it wasn't some other girl. It was me, right? I, I reckon so. Carry on. So you and I got the crazy idea to move to a country where I'd never been. I think I arrived knowing how to say ni hao and zaijian. And I could count to seven because I had checked out a children's song CD from the local library. And it had the a uh, song with the pungyo zainali. And so I could literally count to seven, but I didn't know eight through nine in Chinese <laughs> when, when I landed in China. Okay. So you started studying before you came, but I, when you came to China, I mean, it's a totally different ball game, right? What was your situation and how did you really start getting into learning Chinese? Well, I always felt like you were going to be the one that needed more language skills. And I kind of felt like I was the tag along at first to your grand adventure in China because we had two little children when we moved there. We had a three-month-old and we had a seven-month-old. My skills weren't marketable in China. As a dental hygienist, I could not legally get a work visa over there to work as a dental hygienist because the profession isn't recognized. And when we moved over there, we didn't necessarily have a plan of how long we were going to live there. We didn't know if it was going to be months, years. We just wanted that crazy adventure. And so we did it. So I think learning Chinese for me at first, it was mainly survival. Mm. But as we lived there longer, it stopped being survival and it started being more functional. Well, I remember in those early days, I remember we, we got an AI. And for any listeners, you know, that's like a maid, you know, someone to help out at home. My core ideas behind that was so that you would have an opportunity to start really learning or practicing Chinese. How did that work out for you? Yeah, I don't think that that was my idea, actually. <laughs> I thought I thought we got the I because I was like, oh, this is a hard culture to live in without help. You know, two little kids and just not having any help, not being able to go to the grocery store without dragging children along on buses and subway. So I thought we got an IE for, for that. But I also thought we got an IE so that our children would have the exposure. Mm. And I was more set on them learning the language than, than myself. Just because, you know, children are sponges and why not? We wanted our children to have a second language I don't know if I've ever said this to you, but like what I've really admired about you is that I don't really recall you like studying Chinese, but I saw you picked up a lot when you were just around like being in China. Whereas like me, I, I'm the type of guy I've got to study. I really think that was my advantage. And in a way, it was good because I did pick up things just hearing them. I remember asking a friend, everybody's saying, how da, how da, how da. Like, what does that mean? And then, you know, because I had two kids, so many people around me would say, xiao xin, xiao xin, xiao xin to my kids all the time. What does xiao xin mean? So I feel like I picked up on these common phrases that people would say to me. On the other hand, 
I was kind of disincentivized to study because of that, because I picked up enough naturally. I felt like I didn't really have to study as much. I regret very much that I didn't spend more time studying while we lived there. So when Chinese became more important was when I had kids start school. And then suddenly I realized that I couldn't talk to the teacher. Mm -hmm. And that was frustrating. So that was when I started spending more time looking up things, looking up characters, using a dictionary to try and figure out how I wanted to say things. And yeah, and when we first got there, it was really clunky because those were the days of paper dictionaries. I remember going to the bookstore with you and buying a paper dictionary. So every time I wanted to look up a word, I was pulling out that paper dictionary. And I remember I had this little guidebook that had a really great pinging guide. And I remember just going through the pinging guide and the sounds and trying to replicate them. And I I remember at one point, like even correcting you, you were saying more of an ah sound instead of an uh. Maybe sh and sh. No, maybe it's s and s. Yeah, I think that's what it was. I'm like, no, the e makes more like a uh sound. And you're like, oh, yeah, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> so I did actually pick up quite a lot just from like the little study that I did. Yeah, this is kind of crazy. I picked up a lot of random words when we would go on model shoots, actually. Oh, well, that's right. So, yeah, I guess the listeners would know we... Uh, our kids are international fashion models, right? <laughs> As many people might know, white Caucasian children are very popular to model clothing in China. And if you're there long enough, probably, and you have cute kids, which I have to say we have. So our kids got into modeling in China, and I learned a lot of directions. Homian, Chemian, Kuzu. Chuan Yifu. Chuan Yifu. Yeah, a lot of different words from that experience. Chuan uh, Wadzi. Dai Maozi. The clothing words. Some of the colors, too. So that was an experience. And I would be the one behind the camera a lot of times. The photographer would be there, but then I would be giving my kid instructions. So they'd say it in Chinese and then I'd say it in English. So I learned <laughs> directions that way. And then I started teaching cooking lessons to Chinese ladies. And so I was looking up a lot of words, a lot of baking terms first for those cooking lessons. And then after that, we opened our bakery. We had first cinnamon roll bakery in China. And I already had a lot of those cooking terms and food items, ingredients. And then talking to Chinese customers, I acquired language. So actually, a lot of my acquiring language has been in an as-needed situation. And even now, as I'm substituting for a class, I'm acquiring language on an as-needed basis because... I'll figure out that I have to teach something and then I'll hurry and study for that topic and learn the things that I need to know to teach it and pass it on to the kid. What was one of the things that you were doing that kind of helped you start really bringing a little bit more proficiency in the language? So I remember when we first got to China and we would go someplace together like a market or a store and I would say to you, I want to know how much this is. I would ask you, I would say, hey, can you ask the shopkeeper? You'd tell me no. And you'd say, you've got to try it. You've got to speak. <laughs> and I was flabbergasted at first with like how fearless you were about talking to people. That was hugely uncomfortable for me. I was so nervous about slaughtering this language that I had, you know, I just barely started learning. And it's so emotionally scary to put yourself out there and feel like you're looking like a fool. I think at the time, I was more scared of that. Now I've looked like a fool so much. I, you know, I, I, don't, <laughs> I, you know, I don't think it even phases me anymore. But you had a lot of courage. And I think that really helped me to have courage. 
I was really frustrated with you at times. <laughs> Can't you just help me? Because I had a lot of friends that their husbands had studied Chinese and their husbands knew Chinese. And so they would use their husbands as a crutch and they never learned anything. Rarely you would let me use you as a crutch. You would usually tell me to figure it out. Well, when you were having babies, okay, I interjected. Yeah, her, yeah, but. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, those are some stories. Well, I want to fast forward because the story about you being in China and that time, I kind of categorize you a little bit as a reluctant learner, right? You kind of... <laughs> yeah, <差不多. laughs> All right. But fast forward, like, and I think the, the interesting part of your story is that you didn't really start studying Chinese in earnest till after you came back to the States. So tell me about that and what kind of like now triggered that for you say like, I'm really going to put in the time to learn this language. I came back after almost seven years in China and I could speak pretty well, but I could only read a handful of characters. I would say a couple dozen, you know, living there, you see street signs, you start to recognize Bei, Nan, Dong, Xi. Those kinds of things that you just see a lot on the street signs. And of course, I knew my numbers. But I think when I came back, number one, I didn't have an IE anymore. So I didn't have somebody in my house that was speaking Chinese to me every single day. And so I was not going to get the speaking practice that I had. I think I just got really scared that I was going to lose my Chinese skills. And then at the same time, my kids were going from all Chinese school and they were going into Chinese dual immersion school. And you were still in China working for a while after I came back with the kids. So I didn't have you as the helper for the kids Chinese because before you were the one who was always the person who helped with homework. And I didn't have you anymore. That's all right. I mentioned that on this podcast a number of times. Like, I spent hundreds of hours you writing really, characters with yeah, my kids. Yeah, really did. He really did. So I think I just had the realization that I've got to do this for my kids. And I've got to do this for me because if I don't use it, I'm going to lose it. Okay, it's go time. I'm going to start learning how to read Chinese. And you already had Mandarin Companion at that time. <laughs> yeah. So really, there was no excuse other than I always told myself that I was too busy. I was a mother of four kids, had a bakery, had involvement in, in the Shanghai community and, and my church. And so I always wrote it off as I'm too busy. Mm. And really, that was just an excuse. I found the time when I came back. I found the time. And I really just started with okay, this is my 20 minutes day. I'm going to put in the 20 minutes day and I'm just going to put in the consistent like study time, learning characters and practicing reading. So what were you doing? Because not everyone comes into like saying, okay, now I'm going to really like take the time to learn Chinese and I'm going to like really study. But you have like a grounding, a base. I, I had great conversations with taxi drivers all the time in China. Yeah, Because it's the were, normal questions, right? Yeah, the you normal know? questions. Where are you? What country are you from? <laughs> America. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> How old are you? Ah, you know. Yeah. Are you married? Yeah. 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 Okay. So what were you doing though? Because you already had a little bit of that grounding and you had a lot of oral Chinese, but you didn't have the written Chinese. So kind of what were you doing to practice and grow? Yeah. So I had a great, like I call it preschool Chinese because, you know, I was around my kids a lot. And so I learned a lot of things that my Ayu would say to them. So colors, numbers, big, small, you know, I just, things that animals lots of animals potty training Chinese you know I have great potty yeah anyways we won't go there but I was basically a toddler in Chinese when I came back <laughs> to the States and then it was like okay I have the oral I have the speaking part I have the listening part but I need to connect that with characters so I started actually by doing the Duolingo app for just a couple months I, solid, I'd say like four or five months solid, I'd do it every single day. I don't think that that's the best way for a beginner to learn. For me, it was great because I already had all the sounds. I already knew a lot of the words, the Chinese words. So for me, it was just connecting all those words 
with the characters. You know, I think that's actually a good point to hear that because, you know, John and I were talking about learning to read. Mm -hmm. And we always say, hey, first focus on pinyin. Learn the pronunciation. Learn a little bit of the language orally first before you start diving into characters. And we find research and experience shows that that's actually a little bit better way to go into. So it's actually interesting to hear you say this because it validates that a little bit, right? I definitely think having a strong basis in pinging was very helpful when I started learning characters because I honestly like looking at a pinging chart, there's no word that I can't say just by looking at it. Like I have them all down and that came with time and looking up words in China and, and really focusing on the pinging and just being able to say it. So I was always focused on saying it in China, saying it correctly. I was not so focused on tones in China. You would always correct my tones and I'd be like, oh, it's so frustrating. I think I didn't really get it until I came back and then I started really focusing on tones. And and it, I don't know why, but it took me seven years to like say, okay, tones are important. I'm going to learn. I'm going to really <laughs> focus on tones. Well, don't worry. John still corrects my tones. <laughs> so yeah, the pinging basis was really, really important. It really helped me and it still helps me. You know, I don't memorize every character I look up. I don't memorize every word I look up. I don't think I'm at that stage where I can focus on learning every single character. I look up things for kids for science. And this last week we were studying the five senses, Wu Zhong Guang Guang. And, you know, I could not tell you how to write that in Chinese, but it doesn't matter to me because I have the pinyin down and I'm just talking about it. And I don't think the kids need to learn, in this case, how to write those characters. I just want them to learn the pronunciation and to use it and to use it over and over, just the concept of it in a sentence. I still would say I'm heavily focused on pinyin, but I'm slowly adding characters to that. Well, the glory is, is that if you know the pinyin well, you can sit down there and type it and usually that's what's going to yeah, come up, right? That is the nice thing about Chinese is that you type in the correct combination of pinyin sounds and you can usually get what you're looking for. Now tell me a little bit about, you came back here in a small town mm -hmm. and there's the Chinese immersion program, but you started learning Chinese back when you're in the States, I guess deliberately studying, but you did a little bit more than just learn. It's kind of crazy. I feel like I'm a serial entrepreneur because I'm always getting an idea for this or that. And I thought to myself, somebody needs to start a tutoring business doing preschool Chinese classes because there's a lot of kids that are going to go into this Chinese dual immersion school in our city, in our tiny little small town, that they're going to go into this, but they don't even know that ni hao means hello. And they're going to start Chinese at six years old in first grade. And I'm like, especially where my kids started at three years old and seven months old, learning Chinese and they just grew up with it. That seemed really late for me. So I had the idea of just starting some, you know, Chinese classes for toddlers and preschool age kids. It didn't go so well. <laughs> I don't think that there was the interest, but what evolved of that was doing more tutoring. And so I ended up using the materials that the school used and, and studying those so that I could then turn it around and help kids who were struggling and try and, and help them increase like their reading skills. It kind of felt at times like the blind leading the blind. I'm not going to lie to you. But I figured that I actually was better than nothing, which was what these kids had. So despite all my reservations about looking like a fool or having my own little dose of imposter syndrome, I became a Chinese tutor for several children. I, and I do know there are a lot of kids that have been behind and, and have really started catching up. Uh, and it seems like sometimes they just need a little bit of help. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not like English where if you have missing words, you can still hash together the story in your head. If you have 
a couple missing characters, but those are key characters. You can read something and you can read 70% of it and still not know what you're reading. So have no idea. And I really have found that to be the case with kids that, that I was testing last week. The little paragraph had the word jelds in it. And if the kid didn't know that one character, jelds, then they didn't know what the story was talking about. And it, it sounds so little because there were some kids that was like one of the only characters they were missing in it, but they couldn't grasp the meaning of the story. Yeah. So literacy is a big deal. Yeah, it is a big deal. And, you know, as you usually say, if you don't learn to read in Chinese, you are illiterate. No matter how good you're speaking, <laughs> you know, yeah. gets, you're still illiterate. I started studying the curriculum that the dual immersion school uses. And I started creating resources for the kids I was tutoring and just trying to figure out like fun ways that I could help them. I started writing little books in Chinese, which sounds kind of funny because you and John write amazing books. But um, the books that I've read, I wouldn't even call, they're like booklets, you know, they're like little 10 page books, but just very, very repetitive, very simple language, just trying to get some some practice materials for the kids that I tutor. Well, I got to say, though, Heather, I mean, you actually gave me the idea to start Manor Companion. I just said to you, I think these books you're reading are so great. I think you should sell them. And then we went a step further and I said, you really should produce and make your own. This is such a great idea and nobody's doing it. And there we go. And then there you are. Now you've made some of your own. Uh, just some little ones. I'm already, yeah, but they're great. They're great for some of the the, the young kids. And well, I think this is great because, you know, you went, you know, your skills, you built on them from rudimentary and you progressed and to, you know, helping out other kids, you know, maybe some people listening might say, oh, my Chinese isn't good enough to tutor someone. Well, I think really to help tutor someone, you just need to be higher level than the person you're teaching, right? That has been my saving grace in, in tutoring is that I'm maybe a step or two ahead of the kids that I'm trying to teach. But, you know, for me, I don't know if you you find this is the case. This has been one of my study tips my whole life. Whenever I was in college, I learned something better if I imagine that I am going to be teaching it to someone. And so I'm always reading books. My favorite is reading psychology books, how people's minds work and their motivations. I enjoy that. But I always imagine in my mind that I'm going to be teaching a class or teaching a seminar about the thing that I'm reading. Oh, and really? how, yeah, I do. You never told me that. And I always think to myself, like, how would I inform someone else about this content? And I think that's always helped me to learn better because I have a motivation for learning and like I retain it more. Well, tell us the story now of how you became now a Chinese teacher. <laughs> You're actually teaching at a Chinese dual immersion program. So that's an interesting story because of the United States visa ban on um, work permits for foreign nationals. The dual immersion schools here in our state have not been able to hire Chinese teachers like they have in the past because they've attempted to hire them, but they can't get the visa. And so most of them have been let go and they've had to find local people to hire to teach Chinese. And let's just say there's been a dearth of Chinese teachers in our state. There's just hardly anyone available. So our school hired a teacher from China, and our principal, bless his heart, is in his first year of teaching. And so when he hired a, a teacher, he really thought that he was going to be able to get this teacher over from China. He really didn't know what he was in for. And so I went in to talk to him a couple of weeks before school started because I am the PTA president. He informed me that they didn't have a fifth grade teacher, and I said, told him, you know, I speak Chinese, I could help substitute for a while. We'll come to find out we're two months into school and there's no real end in sight of uh, doing this teaching gig. So here I am, lower 
intermediate level Chinese teaching Chinese in a dual immersion program. And the new recruit. <laughs> there you are. Yes. But, you know, Heather, you know, if you could go back and if you could do anything differently, what would you do differently? I would definitely have started learning characters sooner. I think that's the one regret that I have is that I didn't start learning characters for seven years until I was back in the States. And it would have been so much easier because there's characters everywhere. So I would have had that recognition being in China. I also regret not being more interested in the language when I was over there. Now, now I feel like I find a topic like, say, animals, and I'm, I'm looking up all the different animals and I want to know all the animals. So I feel like I have so much more curiosity now than I did back then. And I, maybe the difference is back then I felt like a lot of the time I was in survival mode. And and I think that is how it is in a foreign language. You're just trying to get by. But I feel like if I could have go back to my old self, I would have said, hey, like, don't be intimidated by it. Like, have fun with it. Be curious. And I think that's what I've tried to do with my students instead of, oh, Chinese is so hard. Like, I've tried to bring the fun to Chinese. And I'm trying to constantly think of games and things that we can play and we can still have fun, but we can learn Chinese at the same time. And, and you know, even last night you saw what I was making for my students, just a little <laughs> game. And you said, that's really cute. And I said, yeah, this is what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to bring the fun to Chinese. So I think don't take yourself so seriously. Like try and, you know, if even if it's you're, I don't know, playing Quizlet and, you know, make yourself some flashcards and you're playing gravity game on Quizlet and you're just, you know, trying not to, try not to blow up the asteroids or whatnot. You know, just try and find some fun and try and stay curious about topics and find things that interest you in the language. Words of wisdom from a woman who knows. Heather, thank you so much for like sharing your story. You are very welcome, Jared. You have been listening to the You Can Learn Chinese podcast. Help us spread the word by sharing this with your friends, classmates, teachers, cousins, cookie baker, cinnamon roll maker, squirrel chaser, muffin eater, watermelon slicer, and that one gal named Terry. You can subscribe on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. And please write us a review so we know how we're doing. You can find us on Facebook and at mandarincompanion.com. If you feel like you've got an interesting story to tell about learning Chinese, reach out to us. Apologies to John Cena, we just ran out of time. The You Can Learn Chinese podcast is produced by myself, Jared Turner, and our editor is James Harper with Filter Productions. And I'd like to thank our guest, Heather Turner, and of course, thanks to my co-host, the man, the myth, the legend, John Cass. See you next time.